Hello everyone! My name is Jenna, but you guys can call me Jen, and welcome back to my channel. Welcome to 24 books that I would like to read before I turn 24. Now, if you guys remember, or if you didn't know, my birthday was last week, Sunday, on the 6th of September, and I turned 23. So I figured, I was like, what's kind of a fun video that I could do now that I'm 23? and with like my age and stuff and I was like 24 books that I would like to read before I turn 24. Now this is a very random array of books <laughs> but with a focus on classics because if you guys didn't know I'm an English major. I graduated from university in 2019 and I had an English degree. I got an English degree, um, an English honors bachelor's degree and I <laughs> absolutely adore literature and all of the classic books that come along with that. I have realized over the past few years that I am woefully lacking in my classic literature reads. Now, not all of these are classics, so stick around for that, but I have 24 books on this list, technically 25, but we won't talk about it. I am excited to dive into them, so they are not in any particular order, they are just here. So let's just start talking, shall we? So number one is actually a book that I have been wanting to read for a long time now, and I believe the third book has either been released or is being released very soon, I'm not exactly sure, but that is The Poppy War by R.F. Kwan. This is a extremely dark, war-centered adult fantasy book that I have heard only good things about. And I've been a little bit intimidated to pick it up because it is so dark and war-centered, so we shall find out. But I'm still excited to pick it up, and I'm planning on picking it up this winter sometime. It is about Rin, who I believe gets accepted into a elite military school, and she is targeted because she's more dark-skinned than everyone else, and she, because she's also poor, and she's also a woman. So all of that, and then she discovers that she has a lethal unearthly power. So, excited to get to this. This is number one. The next one is one that I actually don't own. It is Queenie by Candace Cardi Williams. And I am so intrigued by this. So from what I know about this one, Queenie is about a young black woman who lives in, I believe, Britain, and she has just broken up from her longtime white boyfriend. And this story kind of follows her making questionable decisions and just, you know, living her life. And I've pulled up Goodreads here on my computer and it says that it's Bridget Jones's diary meets Americana in this disarmingly honest, boldly political, and truly inclusive novel that will speak to anyone who has gone looking for love and found something very different in its place. So, very excited about that one. I've heard only good things about it on the book internet, and I would love to read it. The next one is, I believe, a classic. I'm not entirely sure. I remember seeing it on a Instagram page for a podcast that I listen to, which is called Bonnets at Dawn, and it is the book is called The Secret Diaries of Miss Anne Lister, and it is written by Anne Lister, but edited by Helena Whitbread, I do believe, or well, at least the edition that I'm looking at is on Goodreads, and it is about Anne Lister, who defied the role of womanhood seen in the novels of Jane Austen. She was bold, fiercely independent, and a landowner, industrialist, traveler, and a lesbian. She kept extensive diaries of her life and loves written partly in code, made up of Greek letters mingled with, own, with other symbols of her own devising. Anne referred to the code as her crypt hand, and the use of it allowed her the freedom to describe her intimate life in great detail. Her diaries have been edited by Helena Whitbread, who spent years decoding and transcribing them. So I think this would be such a brilliant book to read. I don't know exactly when these were written originally when Anne Lister was alive, but I think it would be really cool to read something like that. The next one, we're just going to take a complete 180 and go to sci-fi, which is a genre that I have not explored enough. I have tried to read a few sci-fi books in the past 
and all of them have fell really flat for me and I think that's just because I haven't been looking for the right sci-fi for me. The right, the right sci-fi for me. I don't really know what I'm even saying about that but I just want to find something that I know I'm gonna really love and this one on this list is a monster. It is huge. From what I've seen, I've seen the ARC copies of it, and I actually have the E-ARC. Can I even call it an ARC? It's an advanced reader's copy of an audiobook through NetGalley, and it is for To Sleep in a Sea of Stars by Christopher Paolini. Now, Christopher Paolini wrote the Aragon series about the boy named Aragon who finds a dragon egg. That one. And I've read the first two books of that series and I absolutely adore his writing. And that was when he was a boy. Like he wrote those books when he was like 16, I believe. They're just, they're really, really good. And I wanna see what he can write now that he's a lot older. I am very intrigued to read this sci-fi, even though it is absolutely massive. I, let me pull up the page. This book in hardcover has 880 pages. I haven't heard anyone really talk about this yet, but because it's Christopher Paolini, I'm willing to bet that it is a very intricately plotted and created world and it's sci-fi. So I'm interested in it and I'm going to be listening to it really, really soon because I do have the audiobook from NetGalley. To Sleep in a Sea of Stars is about Kira Navarez, who has dreamed of life on new worlds. Now she's awakened a nightmare. During a routine survey mission on an uncolonized planet, Kira finds an alien relic. At first she's delighted, but elation turns to terror when the ancient dust around her begins to move. As war erupts among the stars, Kira is launched into a galaxy-spanning odyssey of discovery and transformation. So I'm intrigued by this because it is it has all that like typical sci-fi stuff that you think like war in the stars, aliens, that kind of thing. But it also seems to be really focused on one person, which is something that I need in such an epic world or genre such as sci-fi, you know? Like, I love epic fantasy, which, or high fantasy, which has like world-spanning type of quests, like Lord of the Rings. But with Lord of the Rings, it's nice because it focuses in on one person in the first book. We have Frodo, right? Like, it focuses in on a specific person or group of people, and it doesn't span the whole <laughs> galaxy, which can kind of be hard to wrap my head around. So I'm hoping that this works, and I understand that it is a huge undertaking for me to dive into trying to find myself a sci-fi novel that I actually enjoy, it being 880 pages. But I'm excited about it, because it's Christopher Paolini. Keeping on that same theme of very epic worlds, this one is a fantasy, and it is, in fact, by an author that I really, really love, and that is Brian Sanderson. I would love, love, love to finally read Elantris before I turn 24, because I have tried to listen to this on audiobook a few times, and I just keep losing interest halfway through, because I believe this is a book that I need to read with my eyes. And I find that with a lot of Brandon Sanderson's, I need to read them with my eyes and the audiobook to get me through it, so that might be my plan for this one. But I just am excited about this one because this is Brandon Sanderson's debut novel and it is a standalone. So Elantris is about a city that was a city of the gods but has since fallen out of power. And it follows Ryoden, Raithen, and Serene. So Ryoden is a prince of Arlon who is loved by all including the princess he never met. And at the beginning of this book he falls ill with a sickness shout, it was called, the transformation. It struck randomly, usually at night during the mysterious hours when life slowed to rest. The shout would take beggar, craftsman, nobleman, or warrior. When it came, the fortunate person's life ended and began anew. He would discard his old mundane existence and move to Elantris, Elantris, where he could live in bliss, rule in wisdom, and be worshipped for eternity. But Elantris has now fallen, and since in this shout is still around, still taking people, and since it takes people, people automatically assume that these people who are walking around still are dead. So that they put them in the city of Elantris to basically live out the rest of their existence because they will never die, but they will remain hungry forever. Like, it's wild. So, very excited about that. And I'm intrigued to see where the story goes. The next one is actually a book that has not yet been released. It is released, I believe, on the 22nd of September around there, whatever that Tuesday is, and it is A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik. I have not read a Naomi Novik book before, 
but I've heard only good things about Spinning Silver and Uprooted, her two like fairy tale retelling books. And this book that's coming up, A Deadly Education, is about a school where failure means death. It is a magic school, it has super high stakes, and I believe it's going to be Naomi Novik's first series that she's written, which is very cool. And I've just been super intrigued by that premise, and I have the book on pre-order, so very excited to read that one. The next book, number seven, is a classic that intimidates me to all levels. <laughs> it is so large and so tough. That is Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. I started reading it earlier this year, and I'm 100 pages in, and I stopped reading it because I was just overwhelmed. <laughs> and I was also trying to read The Count of Monte Cristo at the same time, which I'm still reading. How do I explain this? I don't even know how to explain it. It's a Russian classic about a woman named Anna Karenina and her effects on a family, I believe. It's a tragedy of a fashionable woman who abandons husband, son, and social position for a passionate liaison, which finally drives her to suicide. The next one is also a very large fantasy, which also seems to be a trend. It is The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. This is a fantasy book that I have seen around the book internet for so long, and it is highly beloved. I believe there are two books out in this trilogy and the third book has like not even been announced yet. I don't know, I've just been really interested in it and I remember trying to read it once and like physically and not being able to get really that into it so but that was a few years ago before I had really gotten into high fantasy so we're gonna try it again and we're gonna see how it works. If all else fails I have the audiobook on script that I can listen to as well and I am hoping to love it at least a little bit <laughs> uh, but yeah excited about this one. This is, I believe, day one of this trilogy. It goes over three days where this person, I think it's, I don't know how to pronounce the name, I'm gonna try, Gvotha? Um, sure. Um, who comes to this place and tells a story of himself, I guess, and this one book, which is uh, just about 700 pages. It's the first day where Gvoth tells his story. The next one is also one that I don't own, but I am very intrigued by, and I was intrigued by it before I had read any, any of her other books, but then I read The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin, and I have just been so much more intrigued to pick this up, and it's her newest book, The City We Became. It sounds so cool! It is, from what I remember, like the personifications of New York City and its five boroughs, and they're like trying to protect the city in some way. I have no idea. It sounds very cool with the personifications of New York City and actual people. It sounds really cool, and I would really like to read this one. We're just gonna stick with large fantasy for now, and the next one that I would like to read is the first book of the Wheel of Time series, which is the Eye of the World by Robert Jordan. I would like to read this because the uh, the Wheel of Time series is one of the oldest, most beloved fantasy series that there is, and I would like to at least read the first one in this because this is another one where it's like 13 books long, and I believe Brandon Sanderson actually wrote and finished up the series at the end of it to finish it. I'm not sure. <laughs> I know that his name is on is on some of the books, which is exciting. I am always here for expansive epic fantasy, so I don't even know what this is about. The wheel of time turns and ages come and go, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth returns again. In the third age, an age of prophecy, the world and time themselves hang in the balance. What was, what will be, and what is may yet fall under the shadow. That's all it says in the back, and then we go into quotes from people that compare him to Tolkien. The next one is a middle grade that I do not own but would absolutely love to get my hands on and that is Green Glass House. This one is a middle grade that I have heard talked about more recently in the past year where it had like a resurgence of popularity among the book internet and I believe it's a mystery type of middle grade that is very atmospheric for fall time or winter. I can't remember if it was fall or winter but I 
just am really intrigued by it. And I know it was written a little while ago, so I love when I see like backlist books re-brought up into the popular culture and read by many people and beloved by many. So I would love to get my hands on this because I just am so intrigued by it. The next one, we're going back to classics. So this is number 12. <laughs> number 12 is Elizabeth Gaskell's Wives and Daughters. I read Elizabeth Gaskell's North and South in university. I actually read it during the summer once because I believed it was going to be on one of my class like syllabi but then when we actually got the syllabi it wasn't <laughs> so I had read it with the purpose for that class in the summer because it is a thick boy so I wanted to get it over with and I absolutely adored it and I was so irritated that we couldn't study it afterwards because one of my favorite things to do with classic literature is read a book really enjoy it but then go and study it because it's just so interesting to pull apart a piece of classic literature and really understand what's going on or make your own assumptions or like study it through the lens of modern day. Like it's just one of my favorite things to do. And I absolutely loved North and South. So after that, I went and picked up Wives and Daughters, but I have never gotten the opportunity to read it. And I would really love to because Elizabeth Gaskell's writing is just incredible. And I would love to dive more into her work. This is actually her last novel, which I didn't know, but it's about a lively depiction of the gossiping community of Hollingford and its richly drawn female characters. This novel demonstrates an intelligent and compassionate understanding of human relationships. So it follows Molly, who is 17 years old, whose widowed father remarries and her life is turned upside down by a manipulative stepmother. And it follows the two girls, so Molly and then a new stepsister, Cynthia, as they become friends, which is kind of fun. There's lots of gossiping and, and love affairs and stuff, so this sounds really interesting and I can't wait to get to it. Number 13 is another book that I don't own, but it is another classic, and it is The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. I know I'm very late to this bandwagon, but I have been keeping Shirley Jackson's books on like in my mind in the back burner. I do have We Have Always Lived in the Castle downstairs on my shelves, which I'm, do I'm planning to read really soon. But The Haunting of Hill House just has kind of scared me a little bit for a while because it just seemed to be a genre of classic literature that I'm not really that into. I'm not into super scary stuff, into horror or whatever. But upon like hearing more people talk about it, more people read it, I've like people have said it's actually quite funny because it like has all these tropes that we know today to be like really cheesy, but it's one of the first horror novels, right? So I am very intrigued to pick this up and it's very short and Shirley Jackson, I believe I've read one of her books before called The Lottery. That actually might be a short story, I'm not sure, but I read that one and I was very intrigued and people love Shirley Jackson. My friends all love Shirley Jackson and they've all read The Haunting of Hill House and adored it. So I'm looking forward to reading it whenever I do. Number 14 is a, another new release that I believe has been released in August but I just haven't got my hands on yet and it is a YA fantasy that I believe is a standalone which is one of the reasons why I wanted to pick it up and that is Star Daughter by I want to get this pronunciation right. I can't find anywhere on the internet where it tells me how to pronounce her name but I believe it's Shve Shveta Thakrar. I hope that's how you say it. Probably not, but this is a YA fantasy about a girl who is half human, half star. Because this whole like pantheon in this world deals with stars who are gods. I don't know anything else about this book other than it is a standalone and that she's part star and I really want to read it. It just sounds so cool and since it's been released I've heard only good reviews and that is absolutely beautiful so I'm so ready. Number 15 is a book that I picked up this summer and I am very excited to get to it and that is Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. I have talked about this book a lot in a lot of recent videos and I would just I just really want to get to this book. This is a story about two Nigerian people, Femiru and Obinze. They depart Nigeria for the West. Beautiful, self-assured Femiru heads for America. Obinze had hoped to join her in America, but post 9-11 is close to him, and so he instead plunges into a dangerous, undocumented life in London. 
So it is their love story and it's a remarkable novel of race, love, and identity. So very excited to get to this one. I've heard, again, all the good things. Most of these books I've heard all the good things about, so excited. Going back to classics with number 16. This is Evelina by Frances Burney. This is a novel that I remember my Jane Austen professor telling me was a precursor to Pride and Prejudice and that Jane Austen would have read this and been inspired by it. And so it is a Pride and Prejudice before Pride and Prejudice was a thing. So very excited about that. It's about a young girl named Evelina. It was published in 1778, it says here, as an epistolary account of a sheltered, orphaned young woman's entrance into society and her experience of family. Very excited to read this one. Number 17 is yet another book that I don't own, but it is also a classic, and that is Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. I had to think about that for a second. There's too many Bronte sisters. It is by Anne Bronte, and I absolutely love Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. As you guys know, it is my favorite, Jane, it's my favorite classic book ever, and I would love to delve into the works of her sisters, I will say I did try to read Wuthering Heights and I ended up DNFing it halfway through. That was last year. And so I am steering clear of the super gothic because I have also heard that Anne Bronte is the one sister who has written books that are more realistic instead of like super gothic like her two sisters went. So I'm excited to, to read Agnes Grey and I've heard only good things about it. It is a lot of people's favorite books. so. Really excited to get to that one. I know nothing about it other than the fact it's about a girl named Agnes Grey. <laughs> That's it. That's all I know. The next one, sticking with the Bronte sisters, is Shirley by Charlotte Bronte. This is one of her, I believe, three or four books. I know she wrote Jane Eyre and Villette. This one, and then I believe a novella called The Professor. I think those were the four that she wrote. But this, apparently, is really good. I believe it was Lucy from... Oh, I cannot remember her YouTube channel. I will put it on the screen when I when I edit this, but she was talking about her favorite books and this is her favorite Bronte sister book, which is very exciting. And I know nothing about it other than it's named Shirley. That's all I know. A lot of these classics I don't know much about other than the fact that I would like to read them. Why is mainly because of the authors themselves or their historical context like Evelina. <sighs> or that I loved their other work, like Elizabeth Gaskell. So that's mainly my thing. And we're gonna go on to the next one and talk about a Thomas Hardy book, which is Tess of the Duberville. And I just, people love Thomas Hardy and I have never read a Thomas Hardy. So this would be, I would like this to be my first one because I just, I think this would be beautiful. And one of my family friends absolutely loves Tess of the Duberville. This is her favorite classic, so. This is why I'm picking this one. Thomas Hardy, man. Apparently he writes absolutely beautifully. So this is about Tess Derbyfield, who is driven by family poverty to claim kinship with the wealthy Duberville and seek a portion of their family fortune, though meeting her cousin Alec proves to be her downfall. A very different man, Angel Claire, seems to offer her love and salvation, but Tess must choose whether to reveal her past or remain silent in the hope of peaceful future. This is a read that shocked readers when first published in 1891. So I'm excited about this. The next one is a classic but also a middle grade because this is a children's classic and that is The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson. Hugs Hod Frances Burnett. <laughs> I cannot pronounce her middle name for the life of me. Um, this is a really adorable little book that I have had on my radar for a really long time. This one and her other book, The Little Princess, which I've seen the movie for. <laughs> and I believe this one is also being made into a movie or has been made into a movie with Colin Firth. I'm not sure, but I would really like to read this one. I know very little about it. It's about Mary Lennox, who needs some magic in her life. Her parents have died in faraway lands and Mary has been taken to a strange and mysterious mansion to live with her distant uncle. She has no friends and no happiness until she finds the key to a wonderful secret garden. Oh, that sounds so lovely, and I've only heard good things, and one of my friends absolutely loves this book. So. And, all right, this is the last classic on this list. <laughs> I swear it's the last one, 
but it is also one that I'm so excited about and it is another beast of a classic and that is Middle March by George Eliot. I have been wanting to pick up a George Eliot for so long because I've just, I love hearing stories about women writers back in the day who wrote under male pseudonyms like George Eliot and got to publish their books that way. Like I know all the Bronte sisters did like the under the one name of Kira Bell and or Currer Bell and I just oh, I just want to read this so bad. Middlemarch specifically is claimed as her most ambitious novel which is a masterly evocation of diverse lives and changing fortunes in a provincial community. So it's like about a giant English countryside community I believe. <laughs> There's a quote on the top of this that they always have in Penguin Copies and it says people are almost always better than their neighbors think they are. <laughs> I love that. <sighs> All right that was number 21 by the way. So number 22 we're going back to middle grades and this is a more modern middle grade and it is Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky by Kwame Mbala. I have talked about the Rick Ryder Presents endlessly on my channel and this is one of the books from the presents that I wanted to include on this list because as we all know I want to read all of them and I will but this one specifically I want to get to because I did try and read it once and I was just not into it so I am going to try again hopefully when I'm in the mood for this and I'm going to hopefully adore it. So it's about Tristan who has just lost his best friend at the beginning of this novel and he's been given a journal by this lost best friend. Tristan, on the edges of his grief, has also lost a tournament that has like turned his father against him and so he's dealing with all of this and he goes to live for a month on his grandparents farm and when he's there the first night his journal gets stolen by this freakish doll who walks into his room and her, her name is Gum Baby. Tristan chases this sticky creature, as it's called in the synopsis, through the forest and a tug of war ensues by his grandmother's mysterious and off-limits bottle tree. In a last attempt to wrestle the journal out of the creature's hands, Christian punches the tree, accidentally ripping a hole in the sky above Midpass, a volatile place with a burning sea, haunted bone ships, and iron monsters that are hunting the inhabitants of the strange world. Just sounds so good and I'm really irritated with myself for putting it down but I'm very excited to get this one. And the second last book, number 23, is a sequel of a series that I have been reading for the past few years and that is George R. R. Martin's A Feast for Crows. This is the fourth book in a very floppy paperback. The fourth book of the Game of Thrones books and this past year I read the second and the third of the Game of Thrones series and absolutely adored both of them. The third one is my favorite so far and I cannot wait to see where this series goes because I am the one of the only people on this entire planet who has not watched the Game of Thrones TV show past the third season. Like I've watched the first season completely, I've watched some of the second season and then the third season completely many years ago when it first came out because one of my friends in high school made me watch it at three in the morning just to get to the Red Wedding which is kind of torturous but it's fine. So I don't know anything that happens other than how the show ended because you know you can't really get away from that on the internet but I am intrigued to keep going with this series and hopefully George R. R. Martin actually releases the last book soon or the next book? I don't know if he's writing more after this next one that comes out, the sixth one. But yes, I would like to get to number four before I turn 24. And the last book on this list is me cheating because it is in fact two books. <laughs> but I am calling it one because it is found everywhere on the internet as the Dream Blood duology, which is by N.K. Jemisin. Again, she's on this list twice and I don't really care because her books are really great. And I am so intrigued by this Dream Blood duology. I don't remember the individual names of each book, so we're just gonna call it the Dream Blood duology because I know it's also sold exclusively in a bind up of the two. And then I believe in single copies. I don't know. I've done, like, I've tried to find the bind up, but it doesn't seem to be in print anymore. And I've tried to find the single books, and those are really hard to find too. They're like never in stores. I don't know. But I am very intrigued by this because it deals with dreams and magic around dreams. That's all I know about it. 
but I love N.K. Jemisin's writing. I've only read one of her books, which is the fifth season, but the way that she knits together a story that she, like she does in the fifth season, is next level genius. So I cannot wait to read more of her work, and this is one of the ones that I cannot wait to pick up. But yes, all right, I'm gonna stop talking now because I feel like this video has been long enough. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps me out on my little corner of YouTube. And I will catch you again in another video. Stay kind and keep on reading.